Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to all of you who are joining, joining us today. It is Saturday, March 25th, and our special guest today is our March featured teacher, Ken Ehrman. I'm Peggy George, and I'm one of the co-moderators of the show, along with Tammy Moore and Paula Nagel and Lori Moffat. And today, both Tammy and Lori are unable to be with us because they have no internet connection. So I'm going to do my best to fill in for the amazing job that they always do and give our official welcome to all of you. I also want to say a special thank you to Patty Ruffing, who is doing the closed captioning for us today. So that's always a part of the recording. If you want to share this with people who would like to use the closed captioning, either because English isn't their primary language or because they may have hearing impairments and it benefits their viewing. So thank you, Patty. And also big thanks to Patty for the being the person who faithfully sends out our uh, professional development certificates after every webinar. And she usually allows some time to go by before she does that because some people come back in on Sunday or Monday and uh, watch the recording and want a certificate. So thank you, Patty, for doing that so faithful, faithfully for us every week. I would like to now move on to um, our newbie question and ask Peg Bullock to introduce our special guest. Well, thank you very much. I would like to introduce Ken Ehrman. He's a fifth grade teacher in the Penridge School District in Pennsylvania. His school is a small suburban school outside Philadelphia. In addition to teaching fifth grade, Ken has spent the last four years tutoring over 50 different students in grades 3 through 12 in all subject areas, time management skills, and executive function skills. Additionally, Ken teaches graduate courses focus on, focusing on incorporating iPads and the 21st century learning skills into the classroom. He is a passionate teacher, cons constantly evaluating his own teaching, learning styles, and the status quo of public education. He believes that education is on the verge of large transformations and that will have a great impact on the success of his students. He understands that this generation of 21st century learners brings so many more diverse needs and talents to classrooms than ever before. Ken believes that it's our job as educators to meet the needs of all of these kids and these times. So today, Ken hopes to bring you new ideas and challenges for you to try. So we start with our newbie question. What does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Hello. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, to me, Web 2.0 tools are just um, new things that are available online or through apps, whether it's on Chromebooks or iPads. And they are just different ways to engage um, students in the curriculum, um, motivate students. And the reason that I like to use Web 2.0 tools are to serve specific purposes. Um, I think that um, when, I, when I'm searching for new tools, it's always to create something different or provide my students a new opportunity to possibly publish or um, uh, share what they have learned with just their peers, their parents, or the greater community. And um, I always encourage teachers when they're using Web 2.0 tools to have the goal in mind of what they want to accomplish and then find a tool that can hopefully help them accomplish that instead of the other um, situation where teachers are finding tools that sound cool or somebody told them to use and then they're just trying to fit it into their classroom. I think we should always take the instructional approach first and then find the correct tool. So I'm pretty sure it's my time to take over. Um, so I appreciate everyone coming on. Um, I am here to talk about personalized learning through flipped instruction. And a tagline that I'm going to use frequently throughout is that it is just an instructional strategy. 
And um, you'll see what I mean by that as we go through the presentation. You can see my email there and my Twitter handle as well. Feel free to reach out to me whenever after the presentation. I always love connecting with new professionals. And so just a little bit about me. Um, I, there already was an introduction. And the reason I like to put a picture of my class from this year up there is that you know, attending conferences and being on curriculum teams and, and tech development teams, it's all part of my career right now, but everything that I do is for my students and finding ways to provide them with a better experience. And the relationship that I build with my students and the rapport is the thing that comes first for me. And then when you bring in all the technology and the different activities, that's where they really buy into it. And so I always like to start off with a ridiculous picture of my class. Um, so as we move forward, please feel free to um, use the hashtag to get the Twitter a little bit active. I will follow it as best as I can as we are going through the presentation. Feel free to tag me in any of those tweets. I always like to go back and see what people connected with or what part of the presentation or a small quote from me that they enjoyed it. It helps me steer future conferences and presentations. So these are the objectives for today. And it's to review the best practices for flipped lessons. And by best practices, it's what I have found to be best practices. I am not claiming to be an expert. I'm just claiming to be someone that has tried it. And so I will share what I believe are the best practices for, for me and for other teachers. We'll talk about different tools and apps that are out there, the ones that I think are the best um, from my experience. And just tips uh, that I have discovered along the way to hopefully help you implement these strategies a little bit more successfully. And we are going to actually do this by kind of going through my journey in how I flip my classroom and why I des decided to flip my classroom. So we're going to start by going back to what my classroom experience was like before I decided to become a flip teacher, for lack of a better term. As we go through this presentation, I want you to think about these questions and establish your why. And you will see how I established my why for flipping. Just like Web 2.0 tools, we don't want to just do things because it's the new trend. We want to have a greater purpose to benefit our students in our own personal classrooms. And so just think about these questions that you see on the screen as we go through this presentation. And hopefully you can develop your why for incorporating flipped instruction or any technology tools into our classrooms. So just a little bit of background of where I was three years ago before I started flipping my classroom. I was teaching fifth grade as I am now, and we were departmentalized in math. So I was teaching three math classes to three different homerooms. Similar to a middle school format, it was to help prepare the students for their transition to middle school the following year. And I had four groups of students when I looked at their skill set. And I I have always been a proponent for small group instruction in all subjects. And I always try to mold my instructional strategy around that. And so when I would be grouping my students to do small group lessons, I would have these groups to, to analyze. You have the group that they know it, and they have mastered it already, and they're ready to be challenged. And then we have two similar groups where they They'll get it pretty quickly. They may, they may need some support or maybe just some practice time to get there. And then you have a group of students that they just need repeated practice and they need time to just reinforce those basic skills. And so for every unit, I would utilize formative assessments to gauge where my students are. Because what I realized is that it wasn't the same students in one of these four groups. They were constantly shifting by unit depending on the skills that we were looking at. We have students that are phenomenal with fractions, and then when we get to geometry, they're lost. 
And so I utilized the <coughs> excuse me, I utilized the formative assessments to see where they were for every unit. As far as formative assessments and, and web tools, these are my two favorite. They're not the only one. There are tons of formative assessment tools. But I really like Socrative because it allows you to do different types of question formats, true and false, multiple choice, open-ended, and you can use one quiz and you can have students participate in it in multiple ways. They could do it at a student pace where they're going on their own and they don't even see whether or not they're getting it right or wrong. And that's how I do my pretest. They could also be doing it as practice where they get to see their answers. You can even guide it as a class where you're going question by question as a class. And Google Forms offers a great variety of questions as well. And if your school is Google Apps for Education, you can automatically pull their username so you know who is who and get that authentic data there. So these are my two favorite online formative assessments. Sometimes I just do the basic pencil and paper and collect it. Sometimes they do it on pencil and paper and then enter just their answers online so it's easier for me to collect the data. So as I said, I was using these formative assessments to gauge where my students were and I would split them up into different groups. And so when it came time for class, I would place them in the three groups and so you can see they're in three different colors and that was their group. And then at the bottom were three different activities. They would be doing some independent work. Another station would be partner work where they could be doing a game. That could also be a second set of independent work. And then the third station was with me, where they were doing, where I was teaching my mini lessons. On the right, you can see a schedule and the approximate times for each of the things. Um, and you can see that transition, I have one minute, and I can say that it was one minute. I had my routine and my schedule was solid. This was during the time where I was up for contract eligibility, and I was being observed, it felt like, every day, and I was always complimented on my classroom management. And it, it was working. My students were successful with the curriculum, but as I progressed through my career, these problems started appearing, and it was okay, but it wasn't perfect. It wasn't great, and I wanted to fix it. And time became the biggest problem. For example, if they arrived late, the only place that I could make up that time was, during, was the instruction with me, the center time. I can't reduce the transitions anymore. I can't reduce the, the introduction to the activities. I had to cut instruction. And late arrival was somewhat common because we weren't on a bell schedule. The teachers just switched, and we were all switching late on different days. Another problem related around time was if the introduction to the activities, I needed six minutes, seven minutes, if it was a little bit complicated of work. Well, now again, I have to cut the instructional time. It's the only place that I can make up for that. Let's say I'm planning my mini lesson, and the mini lesson goes long, which was very common. So center one now, let's say it was an 18 minute lesson. Well now center two and center three, I've lost three minutes, but I somehow still have to teach an 18 minute lesson with even less time. So this planning for the mini lesson became very challenging, and it always seemed to work out and adjust fine, but again, it wasn't perfect, and I felt that I was hurting the instructional time with my students. And the worst, God forbid the fire alarm goes off and I lose 20 minutes of class. Now my first class, I only taught half the time, and my second and my third class, I have the full schedule, so they're now ahead, and then the next day I'm trying to make up for the time, and it just became a disaster. And from the outside, when you would look at my classroom, it looked very structured. It looked, it looked like my kids had great routines. However, inside my head, I felt like it was chaotic. I was constantly looking at the time, and I didn't feel as though my instruction was as good as it could be 
because of this stress of time. And as I became a more seasoned teacher and a better teacher, I realized the biggest problem with my instruction. I was teaching to differentiated groups based on unit formative assessments, which is great. I was grouping my students every unit. And then when I looked at those three lessons that I was doing, I realized that I was just serving vanilla ice cream. I was teaching the same mini lesson three times, maybe asking a different question, maybe offering a challenge practice versus a more basic practice to the different groups. But I was serving the same lesson three times. And it wasn't the differentiated groups was purely for just pacing of the mini lesson and nothing else. And I wanted to change that. I didn't want to be serving my students the same ice cream over and over again. I wanted to be like Baskin Robbins. I wanted to serve 31 different flavors. So I had all of these problems coming out. And when I read about flipping a classroom, it clicked. I knew that was the answer that I needed, and I knew that it would fix my problems. And so this is where my why was established. Provide my students with meaningful independent activities and small group instruction to remediate, educate, and enrich. And this is how I make all my decisions for all my classes around using flipped instruction and really everything I do now. And this is how I have steered away from serving vanilla. So as we progress, this is going to be a little bit focused on math because it's where I started flipping. But as we go farther into the presentation, you will see that I'm utilizing this in every common core subject. So it is definitely something that can be used across any subject area. So I decided to flip. And this is an image of my first lesson. So Peggy is going to take us into the live binder and instruct you how to view my first lesson video. You actually only need to watch the first two minutes. That's the most important part. So I'm going to give everybody about three minutes to hopefully watch. And if you don't, I'll still paraphrase what you would have seen if you're struggling with your device. Video recording is going to be something that we use a lot this year. It's going to be different in the beginning. It's something that I have never done. It's something that you probably have never done. And it's going to be something that we use a lot, but there are a lot of benefits that come out of using video recording that we can take advantage of this year. We're going to go over some of the advantages that you have with listening and watching these video lessons that you can take advantage of while you're doing it at home. Some of those things are going to include the ability to pause the video. You can't pause the teacher when they are teaching in class, but if there's something that you need to write down, and I'm moving too fast, you click pause and the video will stop. I'm just kidding, you probably thought it paused. Another thing that you can do is rewind. We can rewind the videos, you can listen back to it. Another great tool will be to study. You can study and you can listen to these videos when it comes back time to take the test. So it's going to be another great advantage for you when it comes time to take our tests, projects, anything that you need to review, you can go back to these videos at any time. Something that I want to make very clear to you is that this is going to be a learning experience. I'm learning how this works, I'm learning how to do it best, and you're going to give me that same feedback, and you're going to be learning how to best do this at home as well. And we're all going to make mistakes, and we just have to learn from it together and grow together. For example, my first video when I went back to watch, I realized all the words I spelled are backwards. So clearly, I'm going to need a new way to set up my camera so that if I want to write on the board during the video, my words are not going to show up backwards. Either that, or you could learn how to read backward. Sometimes during these videos, I'm going to ask you to click on different things that might pop up on the screen. This would just be an example picture. It's a picture that's not important to us, but I'm just giving you an example of how you could click on this picture. 
and then you would be able to view it. You might, I might give you a picture that I'm asking you to analyze and ask you to describe it. So that could be one example. Another thing that might pop up could be a web page. And this would allow you to click on the web page. I would want you to explore that web page, get some information, maybe do some reading, do some research, or even just look at a picture or some sort of description of what we're doing in class. And then you would come back to the video and watch more. It should hopefully pause while you go to this external site or the picture. And then when you come back, the video should start again. But I really won't know until today when we try that. I hope you enjoyed the video today. It's the first one I've ever made. When students come to my class, I always want it to be fun. I always want it to be exciting. I try to be funny as much as possible. I'm going to try to do the same thing with the videos. I don't want these to be boring and monotonous for you to do at home. So anytime that you really like a video, please let me know so I can try to do more of what I did in that one. All right, so I hope everyone enjoyed the uh, video. And um, as I was reading the chat, I uh, had a chuckle at Wes saying that he thinks he, he's having an error because it's horizontally flipped until he realized that that was me. Um, so that was my first ever TouchCast recording. I shall explain everything thrown out there. I definitely will be talking about tools, and I definitely will be talking about explain everything and TouchCast and, and how to how to accomplish all this. Um, so I will, I have still and will always use this intro video because it talks about my expectations, it talks about the experience because my students have never experienced a flipped classroom before. And so it's really important for me to explain what it is, why I'm doing it, and I want to be honest with them of what I think the benefit will be for them. And they see that as the year progresses. And it's a great intro for the parents. So the way I actually um, implement this is the, we watch the presentation in class together. And then their responsibility is to go home and do the same thing with a parent at home. And this is a great way to make sure that the parents see it. And it also tells me if the students can successfully access my web tools at home. So it's an important check for me to, to do in the beginning of the year. Questions I usually get are, what do you do if students don't have internet connection? If more than half your class doesn't have internet connection, then you're going to want to take what is called a blended learning approach, which we will talk about. If it's a couple of students, I had that my first year, three students didn't have internet connection, so I actually burned my lessons to DVDs and sent them home with them. So it's just a, one way to, to fix that problem. Um, so as we move on, like I said, the journey begins with flipped learning. And these are just screenshots of different lessons that I have created. And as the years have progressed, I think I'm over 100 lessons. I'm not exactly sure what the number is. And so I was assigning it for homework. And the students were watching at home. And this wasn't an everyday occurrence. Maybe it was only once a week. Maybe it was three times per week. It depended on the unit. It depended on the concepts. And they really enjoyed it. And it was very successful. And um, so as we moved on, I realized that there was a lot of benefits to implementing flipped instruction. It wasn't just the, um, my number one goal with instructional time. But as we moved, I realized how much flexibility it provided me in instructional time. My students were coming to class after watching a five to 10 minute lesson at home with background knowledge on the content we were learning that would have taken me 25 to 30 minutes to do in class. So I had literally created 30 extra minutes per class every day that I utilize this. And it was amazing how all that stress with time and the centers and the instructional and the mini lesson, all of those factors were gone. And it had totally solved the problem that I had seen. But as we continued to utilize this, I realized so many more benefits. Discovery learning is a 
is a approach that I like to use very often. I think it's very important for students to have the opportunity to figure out what they're supposed to learn and not just be told what they're supposed to learn. And I had always done this in the past, but I would only have maybe 10 to 15 minutes to let them explore. And then I would have to stop, teach everybody the content, practice the content to make sure they got it. Well, once I started recording my lessons, I gave them the entire 50 minute class to try to figure it out. Some students figured it out and started practicing. Others needed the whole class and got it towards the end where they were close to getting it. Their homework was to go home and see the way that I'm teaching it and make sure they got it right. And they were so excited to see if their strategy matched mine. And so not only did I give them authentic time and valuable time to try to discover their learning, but also it built excitement in the learning process and they wanted to do the learning themselves. Uh, real quick, I just see a lot on the chat about John Bergman. John Bergman and I'm blanking on his partner's name. They have a phenomenal book. It's actually the book I used to start my journey, and I would highly recommend it. Maybe somebody can find it and dump it into the chat. Aaron Sands, that's the other name. Um, they have a great book together, so um, it's, a, it's a really good resource for you. Another aspect that I found incredibly beneficial was that it put value back into homework in my classroom. And what I mean by that, and you can see the quote because you trust us, I would have the students watch a lesson at home, like I said, five to eight minutes, and they would come in and they would do a couple practice problems at home. And sometimes they would say to me, you know, Mr. Erman, are you going to check our practice problems? And I would say, no, that was just for you to practice at home. We're going to do more today. And so I stopped the class and I said, why do you think I don't always check to make sure you did your homework. I wasn't, you know, making sure they had all the problems filled in on the worksheet. I was just assuming they did it. And I made it very clear, as you could see in the intro video, that, you know, the homework is for you to learn. And so if you don't do the homework, you're going to miss out on your learning. And I'm, and I'm expecting you to do that. So I asked the class, why don't I check your homework? They talked amongst their tables. I brought them all back together. And I said, okay, somebody raise their hand and share. Why do you think I don't check your homework? I'd say three quarters of the class had their hands up. I call on the first girl and she says, because you trust us. Everybody's hand went down. Everybody in my class had learned from our culture, from our homework style, from our systems, that I was trusting 10 and 11 year old students to do their homework. And it was such an impactful message that I had delivered to my students. And it just, it made, if nothing else, it made the entire journey and experience worth it. I'm sure you've all seen, especially for our American teachers, this on Facebook at some point. Parents bashing the Common Core, not understanding what, how their kids are learning math, why can't they just learn the way we've learned? And the chat just goes on and on and on about how the Common Core sucks. And so you see this all the time. And I don't follow my parents on social media, but I do have conversations with them. And I can tell you that I would be willing to bet a lot of money that my parents aren't a part of these conversations because they see the learning style. They see the instructional style with the lessons that I send home. And a lot of parents watch them with their kids or they watch them on their own time. And I make it very easy for the parents to access as well. And this was used during my first year. It was just a survey that I created. I'm not using this to prove anything. But there were two questions that I sent to parents. Is there more or less homework frustration with math compared to the past? 100% said there is less frustration. The other question, do you feel more or less able to assist your child this year compared to the past? And normally this trends down because 
parents become less involved with their students' homework as they are older. But um, it was more. 90% said they feel more able to assist their children, which was another great benefit to the flipped lessons. Another benefit that I saw with flipped instruction was um, students were becoming more learners and less memorizers. And they were believing in the application and learning the processes versus just memorizing what they're supposed to do and discovering their learning. The last benefit I have seen is that it is a superior teaching method. I am not here to say that online lessons, video recording, screencasts are better than a teacher in person. I would never say that because I don't want to put myself out of a job. However, there are some small lessons that are better screencasted. And that is the one that I found was a protractor. Teaching a class of 30 students how to use a protractor in the past was a disaster. I would show them, they would do it on their own, and I would have to walk around and help 28 out of the 30 students one on one. So I decided to record a screencast of how to use a protractor. We went to the computer lab. 30 students watched the lesson one on one, and then they practiced on their own. Instead of going around and helping 28 students after the lesson, I had to help one. And I realized that there are some small things that are just better put into a video. Um, the question from Peggy, do I ask students to take notes or write reflections? I do. Um, it depends on the lesson. Sometimes I will have embedded practice problems so that they can practice the content. If it's for a different subject, they may have to write down important facts. Uh, it's a great way to get basic vocabulary out of the way. They need to know eight vocabulary words for the reading unit or the social studies unit, and you just send those home, and they write their vocab at home, and then when they come in, you can apply the vocab instead of showing the PowerPoints in your classroom. So here's a great quote that I really love to share at conferences too. Flipped instruction will give you the freedom and time to do all the amazing things that you learn at the best conferences. Feel free to copy and paste this right into Twitter if you want. When you go to conferences like ISTE or you know, maybe smaller local ones, you learn all these amazing web tools, you learn all these amazing apps, you learn all these amazing projects, but the first thing everybody says is, how can I find the time to actually do this? This is it. Flipped instruction is just an instructional strategy. It is not the entire class. And the biggest thing that it does, it gives you time to do all the other amazing things that you want to do with your students. Flipped instruction is still just the teacher delivering information. That's not authentic learning. Authentic learning is the students applying those skills in projects and in activities. Flipped instruction gives you that time. And that's the thing that I like to make most clear about my opinion. And this is just my opinion. But flipped instruction is the teacher delivering information. That's not the power. The power is the students applying their learning. But flipped instruction gives you that time. And I truly believe that. And that's why I find it so important. So I'm fully flipped two years in. And this is what my board looks like now in math. And it actually looks more chaotic than it did before. But it's just a almost free-flowing activity in my class. You see all the different independent stations. There's partner stations. There's challenges. I now have five groups. And I still meet with my groups. But it's not on a set routine. I might spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes with one group on a mini lesson because it's a skill that they have tested out that they can't handle. They need more practice. And so I support them. And I have other students that bypass all of that independent work, and they actually go right to challenges. And if there are, and you can see that three of the independent activities start with a lesson. This means that I am teaching four mini lessons at one time in my classroom. I have my mini lesson in person. I'm teaching reading numbers with decimals, rounding numbers with decimals, and adding and subtracting decimals all at the same time. 
and it has allowed me to really personalize my instruction. And this was my goal. My goal was to become Baskin Robbins. And I have now because my mini lessons are catered to the specific student. I'll have students go through a mini lesson, whether it's flipped or it's with me, and then I have them take another formative assessment. And if they still come up as lacking understanding, then I will pull them one-on-one -on -one or maybe two-on-one -on -one if there's two students and do another mini lesson with them. And so I'm offering them an instructional mini lesson that nobody else is getting because they are the ones that need it. And I explicitly explain this to my students. I tell them that I am giving them personalized instruction. I tell them that they don't worry about what their friends are doing. They don't worry about what everybody else is doing. They're going to focus on what stations I tell them to do. And this allows the culture to develop where they know that they're going to get help with what they need help with, and they're going to be challenged where they need to be challenged. And it develops this culture of understanding that you work on your weaknesses and you push your strengths to the limits. And so I do this each and every day and as much as possible as I can. Sometimes it gets a little overwhelming to facilitate through all the data, and so we take a break and we all do the same activity where it will be beneficial for everyone. I have not experienced play post-it, but I would like to explore that. It sounds like um, another one that's similar to that is Edpuzzle, where they can actually embed questions inside the presentations. Um, Nearpod, yes, Peg, I love Nearpod. It's a great tool to use as well. I use it all the time. Um, and it just depends on the lessons that I am using and what I'm trying to accomplish. And interestingly, this year, I've actually sent less homework, well, the flipped homework home, and we do more in the classroom. And I think it's because I have more of a library of lessons available to me, and so I can utilize multiple at the same time, whereas last year I was finishing them five minutes before I needed them. So now that I have a library available for every unit, I can send out four or five at the same time in my classroom. So that was my journey, and I apologize that I spent so much time on it, but I like to do that to show that it's very doable, and you make it work for your classroom, and you make it work for what you're trying to accomplish. There are two basic video form or lesson formats. You can do a video lecture where you see the teacher, or you can do a screencast where you're just focused on the words and the pictures and the content. As far as video lecturing, you can see the different types I've used it for. Um, I try to make them engaging and fun. And whether it's a screencast or a video lesson, you can't go over 10 minutes. If it's over 10 minutes, students will stop watching. You just need to stick to the content and keep it simple and make it skill-based. After my first year of flipping, they totally switched our math curriculum. And it didn't affect me at all because I made it skill-based lessons that the students still needed to learn. So I've used it to introduce science experiments. I've actually walked my students using Nearpod and the videos through a six-step science experiment where the students were watching the experiment, taking data from the videos, and answering questions as groups. And so I had six groups at the same time going through an experiment guided by me, but I was able to walk around the classroom and probe questions and support the students instead of being the only person in the room controlling the experiment and having 30 students trying to watch. They were now able to watch right in front of their eyes. I use it to introduce projects. Instead of sharing in front of the class where everybody forgets, I put the, the instructions in a video and then they take that and they can rewatch it when they forget. Uh, for screencasting, these are different choices. Screencast-O-Matic would be to screencast a computer. Explain everything on the iPad, I think, is by far the best app out there. It is paid, but there's not a subscription, so you just buy it once. Um, you can use, you can embed websites, you can embed shapes, photos, use a pen, use a highlighter, excellent video recording, excellent editing. It takes a little bit to get used to, 
but they have great tutorials on it, and um, it's a great tool for you to to be able to send out your lessons. The other great thing is you can share it, you can save it directly to the iPad as a video, and you can also share it through YouTube. And Peg's question is great on where you share the lessons, because it's my next slide. Um, these are three that I have used in the past. YouTube, if you're making a TouchCast, you can actually send it right to TouchCast. Um, it can be a little bit hard for students to access sometimes. And you can also set, um, you can save videos in Google Drive and share the link through Google Drive. As far as YouTube, you can see at the bottom left of the slide, your different settings. Public means anybody on the internet can see it. Unlisted means that if you share the link, anybody can watch it as long as they have that link. Private, nobody can see, so it's not really the setting you want to use. I recently stopped using YouTube with my students and started exclusively sharing through Google Drive links. And the only reason is YouTube is so easy to access, and that's why I started there. But I actually find it a bit inappropriate for me to send 11-year-olds to YouTube because it's not a filtered site, and I felt it was more responsible for me to use Google Drive. And I think the parents appreciated that, even though they were okay with YouTube. Um, I, I think it's important for me to set an example um, for students using 21st century tools. So these are just some tips for um, planning and creating your lessons. Keep it short, keep it sweet, clear objectives, build in student interaction, build in practice questions, have them verbally respond, or even build in um, using Edpuzzle or other tools to have them physically respond to you. Learning management systems is where you're going to share your content. These are all great resources. Schoology is my personal favorite because of the organizational style behind it. But you're going to want to use whatever your students are using. Oh, I'm sorry. You're going to want to use whatever your school encourages you to use. And they might already have one preference that they are using. Google Classroom is great if your students are using Google Apps for Education. And Moto kind of looks like Facebook. You just post it, and it creates a linear post style. But Schoology really lets you to organize units. I used it Moto my first year because I was building the content as I went. Now that I have the units planned out, I can organize it better in Schoology. So if we were in a different format now and we had done this presentation in person, instead of me just lecturing for the last hour, if I would have utilized flipped instruction for this activity, this, um, this webinar, there would be such a different takeaway for all of you. So what I have set up are actually five stations that you can see on the screen that we could have done today, and I could have delivered all the same content. We could have had one station focusing on establishing your why, and this would be to watch the first 10 slides of my, of my presentation, me lecturing, and then you would discuss with a group and create your why statement. Lesson or center two would be tutorials on how to create TouchCast videos, and then allowing you to um, start practicing. So you would have watched my lesson and then practiced using TouchCast. And it would have been the same in the bottom right with explain everything. In the bottom left, you could watch tutorials on the different learning management systems. And then you could discuss in groups about the positives and negatives of each. And the last center could have been on the snowball effect, my slides that I was talking about, all the benefits of flipped learning. And then you could have discussed as groups on what you would be anxious to try and also talk about concerns and wait for me to come over because I would just be walking around to all the different centers and you could ask me questions. Peggy, to answer your question about organize your Google Drive, um, I, if, if I'm sharing lessons through Google Drive, I would I send out each link individually. So I would be using Schoology or Google Classroom to send out the links. So on the left is what you're leaving here with, hopefully. My story, 
my advice, my experience, my tips. If we could have utilized the centers um, that I just had on the previous screen, you could have still left with my story, my advice, my experience, and my tips. But you would have left with your experience creating video lectures, your experience creating screencasts, and collaboration time with colleagues to share your ideas, your why, and your concerns. And when you shift your classroom to use flipped instruction, this is how it shifts as well. Your students then leave your classroom with your, ex with, I'm sorry, their experiences and not just the teachers. It puts the learning and the focus into the students and not all coming from the teacher. And if I could have utilized my practice that I like to do each and every day in the classroom here, you would have left with so many more experience to, experiences, tools, and answers to what you're hoping to accomplish. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I always like to finish with this. I think this is a great motivator for using flipped instruction. I'm sure we can all relate to this quote. I'm sure we've all experienced it. And your students are experiencing it too if we're not differentiating, personalizing, and flipping. And you can really take this practice right back to your classroom. I want to thank you for your time. On my website, there's actually, under the Professional Development tab, a session review. You can fill out just a short questionnaire. I love to get feedback. The feedback comes to me, so feel free to be as positive or as negative as you want, um, because I'm not sharing it with anybody. So I can, I can take the negative feedback. I really appreciate your time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions now or go through anything that you uh, uh, may want to discuss. And I hope you found this experience valuable for you. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have one more. Just a shameless personal plug. I'm a, I'm a part of something called STEM Camp EDU. It's a week-long professional development and graduate course. You have an option of both. Um, in, at Coatstown, so for our East Coast folks, we do actually have some West Coast people flying out for it. July 24th to 28th, it's four days of hands-on interactive learning, um, all focused around the latest and greatest things in STEM. You can also check us out at stemcampedu.org. Thank you so much, Ken. Wow, that was so helpful. They just get the big picture about what's involved in thinking about flipped learning. Very helpful. You did an amazing job. Can I answer? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Can I answer Wes's question? Yes, you can. And I, I think you got all of the other questions except possibly one. Okay. So go right ahead. Um, I appreciate it, Peggy. And Wes, to answer your question, I think there's using resources like Khan Academy and LearnZillion are great, um, especially to help the teacher with the overwhelming task of creating the lessons. But I really do believe that the students will benefit more from hearing you because they're comfortable with you, they know you, and they see the time and the energy that you're putting into creating the lessons, and I think that has a big impact on the culture of the classroom. And so if you're looking to start, make one or two of your own and use other resources, and then as you build, you can replace more of the other lessons with your own. And could you just talk a little bit about when and how uh, you might have students creating the videos that you would use in your flipped learning? So I will, um, media development, I use a lot in my classroom for projects so the students become comfortable with iMovie and TouchCast and doing all the other, all the media um, development tools. But actually, I also have my students create screencasts. And a great app that I like to use is EduCreations. I just put it in the chat. And EduCreations requires a $40 per month membership, which I do not want to pay for. But as a teacher, you can, for free, you can set up a class, and each student can develop their own login for free. 
and they can create screencasts and actually send it to you all through EduCreations and you can view their, their screencasts. So I actually have my students create screencasts as well to show their learning and to, to practice what they are doing. That's terrific. And do you set aside time for teaching some of those technology things, or are those just uh, they learn it as they go when when the need arises? I I usually uh, do learn as you go. Um, I will design activities around learning it as well. So in science class, my students study biomes. And so I actually created a six-step project where they researched one biome, and they had to use the camera on the iPad to record a fake documentary as if they were in the biome. And um, they had to make it three segments, and then they used iMovie to transition them together. And then for the next biome, I had them do the same thing, but they had to put titles and transitions in. And then the third biome, I moved them to TouchCast. And I would just add features of TouchCast throughout. And so they actually learned how to create movies while they learned about the biomes. Wow. You have such a well-oiled machine. It just it flows. And it's so great to be learning this from you. Um, there, there was another question uh, about what would be the lowest grade level you would use flip classes with? Kindergarten. I've seen it done in kindergarten, too. That's I, I, great. I think that the lower you go, the more it has to happen in school, uh -huh. and the more basic the instruction becomes. But I, I really believe that the teacher that's comfortable with teaching the content can really flip anything. And I have, I've flipped technology tutorials that kindergarten teachers have used, and it's been successful. But the teacher is going through it with them as well. But um, it's really important for you to be comfortable with your content. I started in math because yes. I taught math multiple times a day, and it's also my, my niche. That's where, I'm, that's where I'm most comfortable as a teacher. Reading I have done, but not as frequently, and it's because I'm least comfortable teaching reading. And so you really want to start with units, classes, or subjects where you are most comfortable in teaching the content you can do you know, with one eye closed. You just know the content and you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. That is great advice. And, and Peg said, can you talk about your morning announcements and the kids' work? Yes. So I saw a lot of people talking about TouchCast. Uh, TouchCast is a phenomenal free tool for students to use. It really is a total TV broadcast studio in one app. And there's a lot that goes into it, but it's also very simple to get started. And so I have a technology club. They come in once a week. Um, before school, and they record the announcements for a video broadcast instead of over the PA system for Fridays. And in TouchCast, you can actually manage four cameras at one time, like an actual news studio. And so I have a group of fifth graders that are doing, they're using two and three cameras at once to create video broadcasts. And I will actually add to the chat um, the playlist of all of our news broadcasts so that you can, uh, you can see what they, what they put together. And it's a, just another great opportunity for the students to become the managers. I, I'm there when they do it, but I don't really do much now that they have become more comfortable with it. I'm there just in case problems arise. Otherwise, they, they manage the show themselves. I mean, they, they, run, they run the show. And it's really, it's really special to watch. Oh, that's great. Please do add. Oh, you did it already, the link to your playlist. Yep. That will be great to explore. Well, I think you've covered all of the questions, unless anyone wants to take the mic and ask a question or make a comment. If you do, raise your hand, and we'll be happy to give you the mic. This has just been great. 
Well, thank you, Ken, for all of your sharing today. And um, I know we all have a lot of exploring to do on our own, but that's sort of what flip learning is all about, isn't it? That's so right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Go ahead. So I just want to let all of you know that we do this every Saturday with a few exceptions. And I hope that you'll join us next week for another great show. This is going to be um, a student and his mom who are famous as being the Did Sick Kids organizers. And they're going to be, um, Curran D is going to be sharing with us digital citizenship from a kid's perspective. I know you're not going to want to miss that. And then the following week, April 8th, Adam Bello is joining us to tell us all about Breakout EDU. Then we'll take a break for Easter holiday weekend in the United States. And on April 22nd, we have a great show coming with Steve Garten from Common Sense Media. And that will be a great follow-up to the Digital Citizenship show earlier. And he's going to talk about digital citizenship and raising digital kids. And then following that, Desiree Alexander has a great show planned for us on all kinds of ways we can use video in our teaching. And she's calling it, not your grandmother's video. So come back any Saturday that you can to join us. And I want to remind all of you that Steve Hargan, Hargadon is our, our fabulous mentor. And he has a website called The Learning Revolution, which is a place where you can find out about all kinds of free conferences and webinars that you can join. Also, if you enjoy these featured teacher shows as much as I do, I hope you'll take a minute to nominate a featured teacher and give us a suggestion for someone else we can invite on the show. That form is in our live binder, and it's always there. So anytime you think of it, if you see a presentation or you meet someone and you think, wow, they would be a great featured teacher, please fill in that form and let us know. We also do publish all of our recordings on iTunes U, so you can subscribe to that video collection if you'd like to do that. And it's always posted on our blog in the recording. And be sure to fill in the uh, survey that will pop up when you leave the room. It's also in the live binder. And that survey um, is important if you'd like to get a professional development certificate. So fill that in if you like. And we always appreci appreciate getting your feedback. So that's the certificate. Again, special thanks to you, Ken, for sharing with us today. And thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. And we hope we'll see you next Saturday.